Our guest today is Eric Hillman. He is the co-founder and co-CEO of Europa Sports, headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is the nation's industry-leading distributor of nutritional and sports supplements, sports drinks, and accessories with more than 5,000 products. Get that, 5,000 products representing over 165-plus of the industry's best brands. Eric partnered his first fitness center in 1985 in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and later opened Powerhouse Gym in Winston-Salem. He currently co-owns Sweat Method Yoga Yoga and HIT in Uptown Charlotte, North Carolina. Eric serves as a National Physique Committee and IFBB professional judge and promoter. Eric was a director for the USA Rugby Trust, Eric is a member of the International Society of Sports Nutrition. Eric was on the Strength and Conditioning Department in 2015 to 2019 as the head size coach for Appalachian State University, winning four consecutive bowl game appearances. Eric recently supported the University of Louisville Strength and Conditioning Program. Now, with all that said in the bio, I want to tell you that Eric is an incredible person, He is a great leader, and he has made a difference in the lives of countless people. Eric, welcome to the show. Man, I appreciate you guys having me. How are you doing? Oh, it's just so fantastic to have you because you have such an amazing story. Uh, You started out as an athlete and went on to become the CEO of an incredible company. Now, starting this path, you were a lifter, and you had a great deadlift, a great squat. I've seen some of those numbers that you had. Those are awesome. And could you kind of share with us how your lifting led you to become involved in sports supplementation? Yeah, it was actually, so when I graduated college, I went to a little school in West Virginia called, it was back then, it was called Concord College. Um, You know, sent out 300 resumes like most kids did. Uh, Oddly enough, I got 305 no's, so not really sure how it worked, but, um, you know, I had a marketing degree. Uh, I played football. I just, uh, I'm sorry, guys. I just love lifting weights. Um, I just, I just love the aspect of lifting. I started, and I really started lifting weights when I was 12 years old. The kid across the street from me beat me up every day, mm-hmm. every day. So the last day of school, I brought my brother Sears plastic weight set down, started lifting weights. Didn't see this kid all summer. Well, at the end of the summer. He comes running out, but what I didn't realize is that's when I had a six inch growth spurt and I was lifting weights. So this kid came running after me and I'd been lifting weights all summer and I went, that. I started running after him. His eyes got about that big around. He started running. I've never stopped lifting weights since, you know, and um, I, I, I graduated high school about like everybody else back in the 70s. I was 205 pounds. By Christmas, I was 265. Um, I graduated college around 320 pounds. Um, they introduced me to anabolics day one in college, you know, but back then it wasn't, um, they weren't controlled like they became in the, in the early nineties. Um, but all through college, uh, I lifted, I played rugby, I played football. I really got into the sport of rugby, um, uh, during the college years and after college. When, when I graduated, didn't really know what I was going to do again, sent out all these resumes, got nothing back. A buddy of mine, his dad was a manager of Piedmont Airlines back then. He offered me a job working on the ramp. Uh, I got that job. Within three months, I moved up to full time uh, in the marketing department in Winston-Salem, and that's where I, I got into my first gym. Um, but you got to remember, back in the early 80s, there really weren't supplements, maybe six, seven brands at the most. A buddy of mine owned a gym in Forest City, North Carolina. So he was selling um, Beverly International and Nature's Best vitamin packs. And I said, man, look, you know, and, and again, I'm, you know, I don't, I never had anything. Drugs were a big part of, of my life. My theory was when I was in my 20s, if I die, I'll be big, right? They'll take <laughs> all of my buddies to carry my casket. I was invincible. But I also realized in my gym, that when you bought a membership, all you ever walked away with was a contract and a piece of paper. And, and I didn't want to give, you know, anabolics to, to females who were trying to just lose weight. So I started to look at these vitamins. You got to remember, super vitamin packs, that's all they really were, super sterile complex, which later really morphed into what 
we knew as hot stuff. It was like I tell people, it was a garbage pail product. Um, whey protein didn't come around till 92, 93. We had egg protein that really wasn't egg protein, uh, liver tablets and amino acids. And you got to remember, I used to take handfuls of amino acids and each amino was a thousand, it was a thousand milligrams for one gram. And I try to pop 15 and think I was setting the world on fire. But all of that led me into selling supplements. And then I met a guy in Charlotte, North Carolina that owned his own brand. It was called the vitamin locker. Um, I sold his supplements. Uh, so I picked his supplement brand up really progressive guy, really, um, should have been a car salesman kind of guy, just really fast talker, but he made liver tablets, amino acids, super sterile complexes, sold them in my gym. Um, uh, came in a, a chain, bought my club. Um, and I really didn't have an option. I did interview with American airlines. They wanted to move me to Dallas to run their marketing department. Um, I could have moved to Sarah Lee to run their marketing department. And again, I was in the marketing department in Winston and with my gym and I'm 23 years old. Didn't really know what I was going to do. Um, my 5 a.m. aerobics instructor, who I was madly in love with, got transferred to Charlotte. And the guy in Charlotte that owned this company said, hey, man, do you want to come down and um, be a partner of mine? And partner meant a $5,000 cash check in my computer. I had happened to have a personal computer back then. Wow. So, yeah. So I, so I, so I, I called my dad and I told my dad, I said, hey, man, I'm going to. Um, I'm going to go join a vitamin company. And back then you got to remember I was viewed and nothing wrong with, <laughs> I was viewed as an Amway guy mm-hmm. because <clears throat> we had vitamins and, and my dad kind of viewed me as an Amway guy. And, um, you know, he goes, you're leaving, you're leaving, you know, the, and it was back then the airline, the gym was really secondary. Um, but I, I saw something in the supplements and I was judging bodybuilding shows. I started judging in 1985 and, and oddly enough, and that's where I met Jeff Compton, my current partner. Um, I met Jeff. He had come over with the vitamin locker. Um, and that's where, that's when it really started to boom. Cause it was odd. I would talk to all these bodybuilders and power lifters. And you gotta remember all during the eighties, there really weren't the large corporate gyms as there are now. And if you, if you owned a gym, you were either a bodybuilder or a power lifter. So, and there, you know, GNC wasn't around. The internet wasn't even thought of. There was no smoothie kings, none of the none of the places where you could buy them. And when I when I would talk to gym owners, I would say, look, it's incremental revenue because you got to remember you have the you have the, the blast of customers in January, the New Year's resolutions, and the school lets out in June, and they don't come back from June July until September to when the kids go back to school. And I, it was basically it was incremental revenue. But it, it was amazing when I would talk to a lot of these bodybuilders about taking protein, about taking amino acids. And again, the protein back then was egg protein, taking aminos, taking liver, taking all this protein, because we knew that it was protein that developed the muscle. And in the early stages, I would get the bodybuilders going, nah, I don't take that. I'm all natural. Right. And I'm going, <laughs> oh, should I sell you your drugs? You know? <laughs> so you can't be all natural. But then as, as they started to realize that when they incorporated the amino acids and incorporated the proteins that they would repair and they would recuperate and it's back. So it was, and it was right when the gym business just started to explode. And, and by that time you had more supplement companies, you had champion nutrition coming on board. You had hot stuff that was coming on board. More supplement companies were starting to spawn out of the gym, starting to carry more products. And that's what really led me into. And then in the early nineties, I talked to the, uh, the Davishes, the brothers and really fell in love with the powerhouse gym chain. Um, and you know, I, I could have gone to world and, and where I sat as a judge, I knew all of the franchise owners, um, couldn't really afford a gold's gym back then. And, uh, Will and Norm Davish had become really, really close friends of mine. Um, uh, Will was the chairman for the NPC in Michigan. Um, so I morphed more into that um, while we were just getting off the ground at Europa. And it was just happened to be that Jeff and I just got in at the right time and it just accelerated. Yeah, I used to have some of that uh, old hot stuff. Uh, that When you mentioned that, that just kind of gets me thinking back. Um, the Russian bear combo. You remember the Russian bear? Oh, yeah. yeah like, take uh, like, Victor? Yeah, take like 10 tabs or something at a time, a serving massive bottle but it only lasted like a couple weeks um 
all that good stuff. Oh yeah, the Beverly, the weight gainer. Uh, man, that's <laughs> you're taking me back. And they do, when when and I don't mean to interrupt. No, you. When, it's fine. I remember when e, when EAS was sold to um, North Castle. Um, when Bill Phillips sold it in and this young little hotshot came in and, and we're talking about 1998 and this kid walks in, he goes, Hey man, he goes, and he's trying to school me on supplements and, and not, let me tell you something. I mean, I barely got out of college. I don't have MBA after my name. You know, I'm lucky to have BSBA and we know what the BS stands for. Right. <laughs> so this kid starts school, trying to school me on supplements. And, and I said, boy, wait a minute. I said, what's the first supplement you ever took? He goes, creatine. I remember it like it was yesterday. I said, son, I took liver tablets. When you can say you took liver tablets, you can school me on supplements. We go back so far in the supplement world that we were eating rocks and dirt trying to get big. Yeah. Yeah. And liver tab- and I still take liver tabs, believe it or not. Um, I, there's just something about it. I like to eat, take them with my meals. But yeah, that, that throws you back to old weeder. You know, the weeder supplements, um, man, this is just an incredible story. Um, now, tell me about how then you went from Vitamin Locker to Vita Labs to the Grease Trip, you know, with Lee Haney. Because a lot of people, you know, they, they were like, what is Europa? Like, where did they come up with that name? Tell us all about how that really developed from there then. So Jeff and I, so I, I moved back to Charlotte. I moved to Charlotte, um, started working for the Vitamin Locker. Uh, that's where I met Jeff. Jeff came on board with the vitamin locker maybe a month after I did, not much longer after I did. Um, we started working together, and it, it's I'll tell you a, a funny story about Jeff and I. So Jeff's, in the month that I worked there before Jeff did, Jeff's ex-wife worked there. And she kept going, hey, man, you know, Jeff said if you keep talking to me, he's going to kick your ass. Well, when, when I first moved to the Carolinas working for Piedmont Airlines, I worked in Charlotte for a month before they moved me to Winston. And I, I, I remember training at the Gold's Gym my very first day, and I'm doing heavy squats. And back then, I was when heavy squats, I'm talking about six, six, fifty. Mm-hmm. And I'm over on the squat rack, and and I come back, and I'm and I'm grunting. And I mean, I, again, my very first day, and this big dude walks up behind me. It's not Jeff, right? But this big dude walks up behind me. He stands with his arm crossed. And I went, "This is pretty cool." The guy, you know, the guy's gonna, um, he's trying to um, spot me, right? So I finished my rack and I turn around and say, thanks. And this dude goes, you see that rack? You see that platform up there? I went, I look up and I said, yeah. And there's a dude, there's a big dude standing up there, flannel shirt, blue jeans, his arms crossed, just staring at me. And I said, yeah. He said, next time you see me deadlifting up there, why don't you keep your effing mouth shut? Oh. And I'm like, oh, this is my very first day. Now, you got to remember, I'm weighing 320, right? So I'm not afraid of anything. I said, bro, I said, I'll be honest with you, man. That's my first day. I said, you can either get an ass whooping right here or we can go outside. I really don't care where, right? But I keep looking up on the platform and I look at that dude. Well, that dude on the platform was Compton, Jeff Compton, my mm. current partner, right? So I go to work at the vitamin locker and, and his ex-wife is going, hey, man, Jeff said that if you keep talking to me, he's going to kick your ass. And Jeff and I kind of trained about the same time every day and we kind of avoided each other. Well, so one day I'm, I'm doing dumbbell curls and, and all of a sudden Jeff walks up beside me on the dumbbell rack and I'm holding on to like 35 pound dumbbells. Right. And he walks up beside me. I'm going, all right. And you got to remember, Jeff was big. He was one of the best bodybuilders on the East Coast. And I still think I could take him in a fight. Right. I want to know I could. <laughs> but I'm holding these dumbbells and I'm going, just hit him as hard as you can with the dumbbell. And then you'll have a, a fighting chance. <laughs> and I put the dumbbell down and I said, bro, you got a problem with me? He goes, I would have a problem with you. I said, you know, Kathy said next time I talked to you, he goes, F Kathy, we've been best friends since that minute. We've lived together. Jeff and I have gone, we, we started out of my house. Jeff and I have gone to lunch every single day since 1986, um, unless one of us are out of town or on a Friday. Um, yeah, we, and we've probably only had one fight in 34 years, and it probably lasted a minute. So that's where I first met Jeff. And then, um, the, the guy who owned the vitamin locker didn't pay employee taxes to the government. So Jeff and I had, had decided we were going to leave the company that made their, uh, the vitamin lockers, uh, products was a company out of Jonesboro, Georgia called vital labs. Vital labs called me and said, hey, Eric, we're getting ready to cut you guys off. Um, Joey, the owner's not paying. Would you, would you want to come work for me? And I said, man, I'd love to, but I said, 
can Jeff come with me? And they said, yeah. So they set us up a, an office out of my house uh, where we could call in. And back then you didn't really have email. So we had to fax the orders down to Jonesboro, Georgia. Well, about two months after that, the SBI comes in and Joey had picked up a new partner. Well, his partner had gotten brutally murdered mm. and it was a, it was a bad murder. He, the, the partner was shotgun murdered and his mother was uh, shotgun blasted oh and um, come to find out it was Joey that did it. Um, and he did it for the buy sell insurance money for like $3 million. So when the SBI came back in after they said, Hey man, look, um, they, when they got all of Joey's information and they said, Eric, you were next. If you would have gotten away with it, you were next. Oh my God. So yeah, but crazy. so they found him, well, they found him guilty. He hung himself in jail that day. So that ended that saga. So Jeff and I were working for vital labs, faxing our orders in. One of the things they did back then was um, if a check bounced or somebody didn't pay, they didn't take cost of goods out. They really took out the whole check. So they really weren't losing anything. And it was becoming a financial stress on Jeff and I. Um, I was bouncing every single night. I would bounce till um, till three in the morning, get home, sleep until about 630. Then I'd get up to train until I'd have to go into your, until Jeff and I would start uh, with Europa. So and we did that. I did that from for almost seven years up until 93. Um, and Jeff and I didn't pay ourselves the first two years. We used our bouncing money that we made. And, and, you know, you can make good money if you, if you know, and I, I was the head bouncer, so I was able to make a little bit more money. And then in 89, uh, we decided to do our own thing. Um, and Jeff, Jeff was wanting to go back to college. I think he really had desires to be uh, an attorney. He, he really liked that part of business. Um, you know, he really has got the personality to do contracts. That's about mm-hmm. it. I'm not really sure he could win a case, but he's an awesome <laughs> guy. But um, so I talked, I said, and I knew that, you know, I knew that I couldn't do this alone. I, I just didn't have the business marks that he has. So, so I talked Jeff into it, really didn't know what the name was going to be. And this was in uh, January of 90. Jeff wanted to call it Eric and Jeff's distributing. And it was like, oh, God, I, I mean, it just didn't sound big. And you got to remember, there were really only two other distributors in the game. It was a, a Bob O'Leary boss distributing out of Scranton, Pennsylvania, and Costello uh, out of Chicago and out of Florida. And Costello's later became Optimum Nutrition. Mm-hmm. Um, they were really the only two distributors in the game. And we had a lot of customers going, hey, why don't you guys sell your product to those two? And Jeff said, man, I said, look, we can do it just as well as anybody else. Um, so we decided, but we really didn't have a name. I know you guys had Lee Haney on a couple of weeks ago and Lee and I, um, Lee and I have been buddies forever, you know? And so Lee and I used to do, um, uh, uh, seminars around the world. So we were heading to Athens, Greece. We were doing a workout or a seminar in Athens, Greece for 10 days, really didn't know what we were going to call it. So we trained at a place in Athens called Europa gym. Never heard that word ever in my entire life. And so I'm talking to the owner and I said, hey, man, what does Europa mean? He goes, it means all of Europe. Well, the reason we were over there is because at Vital Labs, we had a Greek distributor that we had sold to that was selling there. So I told, so I'm flying back and I'm going, I, I can't call it Eric and Jeff's. I just can't sound that small. So on the way I land, I walk up and I said, hey, man. I've been thinking about it, talking to Jeff. I said, I really want to call it Europa Sports Products. I said, we'll tell everybody we're owned by a Greek company. And, and back then, that's when the diastinins, you know, the, the, you know, the, the um, ectosterons were coming in. And, and most of the, the products coming in out of Europe were the, the real niche stuff. The, the Climbuterol was coming in from Mexico. And I said, man, it'll make us sound bigger than we are. And I just like the name. He goes... Okay. And that, that's where it stuck. It was from a gym in uh, Athens, Greece called Europa Gym. And now I guess yeah. it's just become this massive yeah. thing. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Now, Europa originally was, ri- it was, was run out of your house, right? It was. We started um, in my living room of my house, yeah. 
Now, back then, did you ever dream that it was going to grow into what it became today? I mean, did you have this vision that, you know, if we stick with this plan, we're going to become this worldwide leader in sports nutrition? No. And you know what? I still don't know what big is, right? I mean, in relative terms, if you look at the next competitor above us, they're $15 billion. I mean, the gap between us and our next competitor. Now, fifteen billion is huge. If you take a look at the numbers we do, it, it that's big, right? So when people say, "Did you ever think you would get this big?" It's like I don't vision ourselves big because I still get up every morning, I still come to work, I still walk to the sales pit, I still ask about sales numbers, I still get on the phone with vendors. I don't have a secretary, don't have a receptionist. I mean, there, there's things that when I walk, I mean, I walk into some vendors that have. 10 times more than we have. So I don't really know, you know, what's big. And it always kind of, it, it hurts my feeling a little bit when I'll get somebody who works with this, whether they have a problem, which is usually when they try to get a hold of me, but they go, man, I don't want to bother you because you're busy. And it's like, oh, we're both business owners. You know, I don't really know, you know, what size has to do with it. I, I mean, I, I know that in the grand scheme of things, um, I know we're influential in the marketplace. I know that we have um, made a lot of companies successful, but on the backside, those companies made us just as successful as we've made them. Um, You know, it's been a tough road because some business decisions that companies had to make that excluded us hurt your feelings when you know deep in your heart you were the guy who stepped up to the plate to help them. But I mean, I could have. You know, Jeff and I started a little brand called ISS Research back in 1990. And then when Bill Phillips and when Paul Gardner started Muscle Tech, they both came to me and said, hey, look, man, um, we don't want to create another Costello's where Costello's was a distributor, but they used their brand. But they used all the other brands to grow their brand. And we had to make a decision. And in 97, I believe, um, we moved it out of house. Um, Ron McAfee, who was one of our, who was our national sales manager, um, took it and, and it became his company. Um, and he just sold that to Hershey's for $400 million and it was called one brand. So we could have made that decision back in 90 to be a brand and, you know, hindsight being 2020, um, I probably would have been out of this game a long time ago had we have done that. Um, but you know, when you're a distributor, then you get to be buddies with everybody because, our industry, it, 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 it's a bodybuilding industry. I don't care how you look at it. It was created from bodybuilding. And a bodybuilder on stage is not going to tell another bodybuilder how he trains, how he diets, or how he sleeps, or what drugs he takes. And if you work for one supplement company, you can't like another supplement company. You just can't do it. And I didn't want to be the guy who couldn't like anybody. Um, so we decided we wanted to try to help everybody. So, you know, it, it was a it was a game that we played. We just love what we did. We didn't we never and today, let me tell you something. We don't know how big we are because of what we're going through now. You know, we understand that what we put in place has allowed us to move through this. Um, you know, but you know, we feel for sixty percent of our customer base has been closed for over eight weeks. And we struggle with them. I mean our average size order is so small because we deal with over 16,000 little mom and pops. And right now they're closed. So, you know, big is, I don't know if, if what it feels like to be big, because I've got a a guy bigger than me that I would love to be a $15 billion company. Um, That's big. That's big. That's what makes you such a great leader is the accessibility, your perspective on things. I mean, it's just amazing. And I have to ask you this because I, I believe you were some of the ones that really pushed this out uh, at the time. When I was younger, I used to read Muscle Media 2000 religiously, uh, besides all the other ones. But how influential was when EAS and their phosphagen, when that came out, how influential was that on, on the industry? And weren't you guys some of so, the first people that carried, like distributed? We that? were. Yeah. Yeah, we were. And so we distributed, we had the rights to Dan Duchesne's um, Designer Way. Hmm. Bill had rights to Designer Way when, and you, you got to remember, there was a time probably from 1990 to 2000 and 
2003, 2004, if you wanted to get into the U.S. Marine Corps, you had to come through Europa, had to. And um, for the brand Cybergenics, for Metrex, uh, for Weeder, they, they knew that, they're, that they wanted to get into the Marine Corps. Um, they just didn't have a way. So we were fortunate that uh, I was doing a seminar down at Paris Island Marine Corps Base. That's the recruit depot on the East Coast. Um, I, I finished doing a seminar and this guy walks up to me and he trained and he goes, Hey man, he goes, can you do that same seminar up in, uh, in Quantico, Virginia? And I went, yeah, for a fee. Yeah. You know? and so they brought me up to Quantico. I did a seminar who I didn't realize I was doing the seminar for, um, were more generals who were over the exchange retail system. And they said, look, we'd like to try to bring this stuff in. So, um, so we did a presentation. We did the very first setup at Camp Lejeune Marine Corps Base. Um, sold, took, took a couple of body, took Jeff and my, my partner, took a couple of local bodybuilders in, um, put $15,000 in of inventory, sold it all within like an hour. Um, yes. And you got to remember, this was back when the, the Marines didn't have a way to buy supplements because, again, there, there, there was no Internet. You didn't yeah. have what we have today. Um, and it just became an explosion through every single Marine Corps base in the world since from 1990 to, like I said, to 2004, I traveled to every single Marine Corps base in the world doing seminars on training on supplements, how to take supplements, how to train in the gym, um, how they work with it. I've been to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, probably 10 times. I mean, I've, I've flown in a Harrier, uh, trainer jet, you know, and, and I mean, I've, I was able to experience a ton of things with that, but the only way you could get in. So it allowed us to get metrics. Um, when, uh, Con, when Dr. Connolly gave that distribution to Bill Phillips and Bill allowed me to sell that into the Marine Corps, um, same thing with Cybergenics. So it, it gave us a lot of access to brands that were selling really well that nobody else could get. Um, so there was a time for the early, our, our early days that if you wanted to launch a brand anywhere, you had to come through Europa. Um, so that that's where, you know, but when Bill lost, when Bill, but you got to remember, so Bill knew so much about supplements, but that magazine had Dan Duchesne, mm -hmm. had Jim Wright, I mean, had, had all of the steroid gurus that told you how to take anything. And it's, and it honestly was just like when Jeff and I started, if I knew about drugs, I had to know about liver tablets. I had to know about super sterile complex. And if I said that it worked well with it, well, Bill just became the guru, but Bill is an evangelist. He, he understands what motivates people to action. And, you know, I, like I've always said about Bill Phillips, I've never met a guy who could get somebody off the couch as fast as he did. And he took, he took vanadyl sulfate and named it V2G. I paid $7 for vanadyl sulfate. Nobody buys it. Bill launches it under EAS calls it B2G, sells it to me for $17 and I can't get enough in, right? So he just, he just created a whole boom, but Bill brought people into the, our industry that was primarily bodybuilding and powerlifting. He brought this new athlete in, kind of much like with this coronavirus, this coronavirus is going to bring an active athlete back in. There's people walking in my neighborhoods right now that I've never seen leave their house. Yep. Now, will they ever take, they will never, ever, ever take a pre-workout with 300 grams of caffeine in it, but you know, they, they will take antioxidants. So what Bill did with, with, and you know, he just got it back. He just got myoplex back mm -hmm. and he got, um, body for life back. So Bill will be relaunching myoplex again, but he, when he launched myoplex body for life had just started booming but Muscle Media 2000 was taking off because everybody wanted to read about what was was new coming down the pipeline. And he had all he had all the big names. He Bill Phillips, Joe Weider did it in the 60s. Bill Phillips did it in the 90s. I know you talk about designer way. Did you guys ever carry Ultimate Orange? I had to ask that. We were the we were the only distributor of Ultimate okay. Orange. I, I, yeah. I used to take them when I was younger. Oh my goodness, that was that was crazy. Uh, that so was the, the legit. best marketing thing that Dave <laughs> Jenkins ever did on Ultimate Orange, if you looked at it, it said, "If you are drug tested, do not take this product." Oh come on, right? 
nobody's drug tested. So it's like, shit, this has got to be strong. Yeah. If you were drug tested, do not take this product. Oh man. Ultimate orange was so crazy. That, that was like the father of, of pre-workouts. I think for a lot of guys, um, this is just, I, I got to change your name to like the most interesting man in the world. Um, <laughs> now as a Michigan fan, because of your coaching at Appalachian state, I'm sure that you get a lot of special treatment from Ohio state fans when you're in Columbus. So I was actually at that game in the big house. How did you become involved with the strength and conditioning program at Appy state? So, um, and I'll, and, and let's, let's go back to uh, preferential treatment by, um, the Ohio <laughs> state fans. So I always make sure that I wear one of my bowl rings. So, cause I know somebody there is going to say, man, where's that bowl ring from? People will, I mean, if I wanted to drink absolute vodka all night long, I would never have to pay for it in Columbus, Ohio. So, you know, it, yeah, it, it's amazing how Appalachian State kind of, and, and I will tell you, people in Appalachian and Boone, North Carolina, in 30, 35, will still be talking about that game. Yeah, That game will go down in the history annals. Of anyway. So um, it was in early 2014. Uh, we had worked with a, a strength coach out of Rhode Island. His name's Mike Serignano. Uh, and when I was down at South Carolina, he was also one of the assistant strength coaches in South Carolina. Um, I was down there trying to talk to the nutritionist at USC South Carolina about bringing in um, this program that I'd been working on for athletes. And it was basically a concept of a 24-hour clock. And, and, and we know that, that th- there's, there's two ways to recuperate muscle. Sleep and protein, uh, three drugs, right? If you could do drugs, but sleep and protein. And we knew that athletes weren't getting enough protein in their diet, especially college athletes, right? So uh, I'm down at USC trying to talk to this um, Joey, who was the sports nutritionist down there. And I'm going, look, you need to up the protein in these players' diets. And, and if you just go back to old bodybuilding and powerlifting, what we've done since the 90s and since the inception of especially designer whey and whey protein, you, bodybuilders are never hurt. If you really take a look at a bodybuilder, yeah, they may have a torn bicep, torn pec, but it's because they're trying to do 150-pound dumbbell curls. But on the whole, most bodybuilders are generally muscle healthy. But then you take a look at a college athlete, they always got soft tissue tears. They're always tearing anything because their intake of protein isn't high enough. So I've worked on a 24-hour clock that basically – puts available protein every hour on the hour, you know, and, and whether Jose Antonio says I'm whacked, whether Tim Zickenfuss says I'm whacked, every single athlete from bodybuilder to football player that is put on this protein clock, they stay recuperated. And so, and I, so I go down and talk to this kid, Joey, and he says, Eric, you're going to kill football players. Plain and simple, you'll kill them. I went, look, I'm not going to kill football players by giving them protein powder, I'm going to help them survive, right? He said, I will never, ever, ever um, put that program into place. So I left there and I ran into this Mike Serignano as I was leaving. We said, hello. He gets the job at Appalachian State. And he calls me and said, hey, man, what you were offering down there, can you come talk to me about it? Went up and Mike is a sponge. I mean, one of the, one of the greatest strength coaches I've ever met in college football. And he starts talking about it and he goes, let's do it. And um, so they, they said, man, do you want a position? And I said, yeah. And he, and Mike goes, how about if you're our new, how about if you're our head size coach? And all I did was make sure I kept size on OD linemen and linebackers and anybody losing weight. And all of a sudden now I can't, the very first game for me was the Michigan return game, Mm. you know, and, and I have an experience being called, you know, pig swine or, you know, the Michigan fans were brutal until they went up like 54 to nothing. And then they clapped for us as we're walking off. But that was my very first game. Won the next game. We played a little D3 school, blew them out. But then we played Miami in Boone, blew us out. Then we went to game four. We played Wake. And we hadn't scored much over 21 points in two years. Um, and we scored 55 plus points for the Wake Forest game, but lost it in overtime. Everything that we started implementing kicked in week five. Mm. Won out, won our first bowl game, 
and then the rest is history for Appalachian State. My next four years, what Mike had done at Appalachian, what Coach Satterfield had done, and what Mike did to give Coach Satterfield the leg up was he followed the protein requirement. Now, it does help when your head size coach, you know, is co-CEO of a of a candy factory for athletes, right? So we were able to get them protein powder on demand. We could get it to them next day. Um, these kids were, were fueled with protein, but they were big, they were strong. And Mike is such an intense trainer that he will break you down every muscle he'll break down today. But because of the way we were refueling them, they were recuperated for tomorrow. He could break them down tomorrow. So come game day, you had, a, you had a player whose muscle bellies were thick and strong and they were fast. And they, you know, we, we learn now that, that the game is one on the line, right? We're all, and you just can't, you know, plyometrics in college football, it doesn't matter how high a lineman can jump, it's how far he can push that defensive player back. So, what tools that we implemented to make sure that they were consistently fueled? is what happened with app. And that's where then it just became where it that's what, but that Mike had given me the title head size coach. I love that. Um, how did you get your start with the Arnold? I know you're there from the very beginning and how much did the closure this year affect you guys? I mean, it, you guys are synonymous with the Arnold. I mean, everybody talks about Europa. You guys run a first class operation. Everybody knows about it. So how did you get started, and then how did the closure affect you guys this year? So I, when I worked at the at Vital Labs in 1989, I set up at the Columbus Pro Show, um, and that was the. And then 1990 was the first year of the Arnold Classic, and I can remember the first year of the Arnold Classic. I looked up and I said, "Man, one day I want to be sponsor of this show," and that was our. That, that it re, we hadn't even really started. Cause we didn't start till June of 90 and the Arnold was at the end of February of 89 um, or at the end of February of 90. But I, I, you know, in my life, I've never, I haven't set many goals. I've only set a couple of goals my entire life. And the reason why, you know, Jeff, my partner is a goal setter and everybody talks about setting goals, but my fear with setting a goal is I, I didn't want to set a limit. And every time you set a goal, I didn't want to go, Oh, well, I'm there. And then I was I was always afraid that I would quit. So I never set a goal because I really didn't want to set limits on myself. You know, I set a goal when I was 12 years old. I wanted to build my mom and dad a house. And 10 years ago, I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. Um, And I really didn't have many more goals after that, except for being a sponsor of the Arnold Classic one day. And when um, when GNC uh, dropped it. Bob and Jim Lormer came and said, hey, is this something you would like to have? And if anybody wants to know what I can be, what what my value is, it was 70000 I had to spend $70,000 more than I do every year at the Arnold to get title sponsor. So if you, if you want to know what my what my worth is, it's seventy grand because that's what it cost me to put my name up on, up on that top. And we were able to do it for a few years. Um, and then what we, we, really found out is that fewer and fewer of our gym owners, because the Arnold was getting so crowded um, and fewer of our customers were coming. And then what was happening, if you remember, we were considered the VIP booth of the Arnold. All the big names were in our booth and we had the big center booth, but you couldn't move in our booth. It was so crowded for people just trying to eat and try to just, and I hate to just say be seen inside of our booth, but that's what it became. And so we finally decided that, look, we get very little time to spend p- time with people who who actually like dealing with us. Um, so we decided to move it off the floor and move it up to a, a sweet meeting room. And you didn't have to scream. My voice was, you know, on Sunday I could go home and I had a voice, but I could communicate with everybody. Um, it, it, it wasn't, you know, we did lose that VIP appeal. But for the people who do business with us and Arnold still comes to the, you know, comes up to the suite um, and, and people that, you know, are, are VIPs. And really, we, we want to be VIPs to people who deal with us. I want them to be able to come up and see a Lee. I want them to be able to come up and see the pro bodybuilders. But when you get locked in that booth, it just becomes an escape from how crowded the Arnold was. 
Um, you know, this year, I call this year a mulligan year. I mean, it, it's it's a do-over year. You know, I don't, I don't think we're going to get back. I know they just moved the Olympia to December. Um, the Expo has been moved to, uh, you know, it's all moved to Planet Hollywood. You know, it, and I, I talked to Dan Solomon religiously. And I think that, you know, a couple of things in December, and we all know fourth quarter in our industry is tough. Um, this year has been tough on our whole industry. So I, I applaud Dan for having the show in December. We're trying to, to talk to our vendors about being there. Um, we want it to be a good show. Um, I just think that any, you know, we, we've had to postpone the, the first two Europas. Um, you know, and what's sad is the Orlando show we've postponed. It'll be July 4th weekend in Orlando, um, which, you know, I don't think there's any bad weekend for Orlando uh, if you have family, but you know, it's, it, it's what, it's the time we live in. Uh, I just saw where the rock had moved his to October, 2020. Um, you know, I, I think for the bodybuilding shows this year, I do think it's going to be, I think it's going to be tough. I think it's going to be tough because the supplement companies are just struggling. I don't think there will be a few supplement companies that can survive out of this. I really don't. So, I mean, so, I, there's so much involved so with this from Europa Man to the Europa Games. I mean, you really have done it all. And um, I'm just excited to see, you know, how this thing continues to grow. And people need to check that out because there's so much more than what we're talking about here. But, you know, being respectful of your time, I do want to finish up with a couple key questions. What do you see as the game-changing supplements and nutrition trends right now? I mean, you guys have always been on the, the edge of distribution. What's the next game game changer or what do you think is the next trend you see? Because, you know, people are way into the functional fitness movement right now. You know, what is that trend that you are noticing? So, so if you look right now, carbonated beverage just occupies the, the space. Um, Jack Owak did an incredible job of taking a carbonated beverage and making it a, a billion dollars. We, we've never had a company reach a billion dollars. Um, Jack Owak took, did it, has done it with bank. Um, if you take a look now, C4, everybody, and it, it, it's when, it's when bars came out, everybody had to have a bar. Then when protein RTDs came out, everybody had to have a protein RTD and we just move in that direction. So now, um, carbonated beverages, um, are, are a big ticket, but what carbonated beverages have done, it's taken the place of a pre-workout post-workout. Um, because the, the carbonated beverages now also contain amino acids. So if you take your caffeine in your, let's say Bang or let's say C4, or if you take any of the Bucked Ups, any of the Celsius, any of the brands that have the, the, the carbonated um, Bang look, um, it's 300 milligrams of caffeine, which takes into place your pre-workout. And then if you, if you remember or if you know, um, branch chain aminos have just skyrocket branch chain aminos were big in the 80s went to a down funk and now they've just skyrocketed back so people were taking branch chains immediately following their workout in these new energy drinks what you have is you've got your pre and post and what you see those drinks have cannibalized protein out of that cooler if you look at a cooler now you don't really see a lot of muscle milk you don't see a lot of protein based drinks, even though they're in there, but where they used to occupy 50 shelf space, they now occupy 12. Um, there's still a place for it, but if you're, if you're looking at what the emerging market is, it's going to be carbonated beverages and they're going to find different avenues for carbonated beverages. You're going to see some big nortropic focused carbonated beverages coming out. Um, and then what you will also see is you're, you're going to see protein powder still do well, Functional foods are just gonna are, are just going to cannibalize a lot of stuff. People are just tired of just straight protein powder. Um, you're going to see. I mean, even our the nuts, the um, the chips, the cookies, um, all the the cooler functional foods are, are just skyrocketing. But what you're going to see post COVID nineteen is, like I said earlier, you're going to see this new active athlete come in who are just your average walkers. 
that that have never been in shape. And honestly, if Bill Phillips could merge back in at this point, they don't have they don't have a, a, a talking source. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to take. They don't know what they need because these are people that were body for lifers before they were body for lifers that didn't that knew that they needed to get in shape and they didn't know how to get in shape. But they had a Bill Phillips and a Barry Sears who was talking to them. Well, now this whole new active athlete and now you got gyms closed, so they can't go back to it. They can't go into a gym. If you go to a health food store, really in the health food store, what we have today are still the Mm pre-workouts. And it's like the reason CrossFit community never really hit on the bodybuilding supplements or the bodybuilding manufacturer supplements didn't win at CrossFit is because they try to take their current pre-workout and sell it to a CrossFitter. But most of the current pre-workouts contained a pump. And the last thing you want to give a CrossFitter is a product that's going to give you a pump. So it, it, the CrossFitters never gravitated towards the supplement companies. So supplement companies just bailed out of that market, even though it's a huge market. I mean, they, they, it's, and I'm not just say CrossFitters, they have 45s, sure. the group training, that high and yep. hit that hit training market. But I think this new market coming in, which there's going to be millions coming in, are going to be looking for something to give them energy, a protein, um, anything with uh, immunity boosters. Um, because that's why they're doing it. They don't want to be bodybuilders. They just, if they get this COVID-19, they just want to be able to beat it. And I think that that market coming in, and even if you see the numbers for current sales, immunity boosters, C is, is if now foods is just crushing because of their immunity boosters and C and we don't even sell now. Um, just a couple more quick questions. The first one is this, especially for young athletes and young entrepreneurs out there listening, what do you consider some of the secrets to your success? I mean, I I always view these podcasts as, you know, our guest investing in listeners. If they're listening out there, what are some of the secrets you would say uh, to your success that they could emulate? So my dad was the best salesman I've ever met in my entire life. My whole life, my dad worked for Sears Robux. And he sold home improvement. He sold dishwashers, disposal. He would sell fencing. And my dad used to, to do a thing. He would, he would go to work about a half hour early, sit in the parking lot, sit in his car. And when somebody would get out, and I remember this was back when Sears were standalone buildings. They weren't in the malls like they are today. He would sit in his car. If somebody would start walking up, my dad would get out, walk to the trunk of his car, park, open the trunk. And go, oh, hey, how you doing? Not say I'm Chuck Hillman. I sell, I'm a salesman. Just say hi, right? And he would do that for about 15 or 20 minutes because I think my dad realized that the average stay at a Sears was about 45 minutes. So he would do that for about 15, 20 minutes. And then he would go in and stand. And as they would walk by, he goes, oh, hey, didn't I see you in the parking lot? My dad called them parking lot friends. And one of the key things my dad told me is that, remember, he said, my dad, he called me boy. He goes, boy, remember this. He said, a friend is a friend for life, but a customer will leave you in a heartbeat. And I, I used to go to the gym early and sit out in front of the gym and say hello to people as they came in because I wanted them to be my friend outside. And, and so I wanted them to be my friend on the inside because if they were just a customer, they would go train anywhere else they wanted to train. And what we try to instill in everybody that's worked with us here is that and make them a friend first. If they never buy from you, that's up to them. But man, if you at least have them as a friend, you can always call them and it's not an awkward conversation because they don't buy. I've had tons of people who are buddies that own gyms and health food stores that never bought from me. They just have a different philosophy on, hey, we just want it cheap. And it's like, man, I, you know, I just enjoy having you as a friend, right? Um, so I, I really try to live our life by, you know, basically nobody people aren't customers right because they, they just they know their customers now unfortunately we now deal with people who are just customers they buy from us either because it's just cheap or they have to right um but but we still investing in our business um you know the the greatest thing ever to see how much you love your your company is don't take a paycheck you know and see how you can work you know you can't do that for too long because what i realized is that people like getting paid for what they do but you have to be able, especially like I'm, I'm seeing a lot of these owners right now that they're not able to take paychecks. 
and they, they didn't save the money or they didn't invest it back into their business, they, they bought big houses and they bought big flashy cars. And yeah, they look, look great, but now they can't make their house payment because they didn't put any money away or they didn't invest back into the infrastructure. Jeff and I didn't take a paycheck because we couldn't afford to. We didn't take a paycheck because we knew that the inventory that we had in the back, and it was back when nobody would give us credit, it, it was valuable. But we bounced at another job. And our value is if people say, man, you must be rich. My warehouse is rich. If the day ever comes that I can sell this place, hopefully I will do OK after 30 plus years. But um, I, I just see too many people. They just take too big of salaries. They don't see what their living expenses are and, and they just go broke. And, you know, I see that. I do think that if you're going to be in a partnership with somebody, you know, I haven't seen many partnerships work. I really haven't. If you take a look at in our industry, some of the greatest partners, I, I don't want to name them, but, you know, BSN, it just, you know, it, it just didn't end well. There are just a lot of partnerships that don't do well because both people want to be the face of the company. And, you know, my dad also told me, he goes, hey, man, you know, if partners are only good for dancing, but if you got to have one, only one can lead. Right. And Jeff, I call Jeff my Jesus night. And do, do you know what a Jesus night is? So Jesus nut is that bolt. If you take a look at a helicopter, the very last thing that goes on that helicopter is that bolt that holds that blade on. Mm. That blade spinning so fast that if it wasn't for that Jesus nut, that Jesus nut holds that helicopter together. But you don't even know what that Jesus nut is. All you do is look at that blade, right? Everybody sees the blade. And, you know, Jeff is my Jesus nut. He, he doesn't get out in public much. He doesn't make his face well known. Um, and he's, he's let me do that. Um, but I think that's because we don't, we don't try to go over into each other's territory. He loves accountants, loves bankers, hate bankers, hate accountants. He, he, and he's probably one of the greatest salesmen I've ever met in my entire life as well, but he just likes doing the back end stuff. So if, if you're going to have a partner, you, you just have to understand that you can't have two faces of a company. It just doesn't work. And you know, what young kids need to understand, and, and I'm dealing with this with a lot of people, um, he who controls the company, he who controls the money will control your company. So if you go get a financial loan from somebody to get started, understand they own your company. Mm -hmm. And all the, the great advice and all the great things you want to do, he who controls the money controls that company. And I just see so many young kids. I, I just I'm dealing with a guy right now that had great concept. He went out and raised capital to start the company and they fired him uh, six months ago, you know, and it, it was, but that's what happened. He just, he didn't have the money to start it, but he wanted it started. So he just couldn't, just couldn't keep it going. That is excellent advice for anybody out there listening. And, you know, you put those things into practice. I mean, there was some real golden gems today uh, that we took out of that. That was pure gold. So where can people find out more about you Europa, Europa Sports, and all that it entails. And is there anything else that you would like to share? So, yeah, they can always go to europasports.com if they want to read about the company. But we don't sell to the end consumer. Um, I, I take that back. We are right now. If, if the end consumer wants hand sanitizers, um, one of our companies, uh, it's called Uncle Pete's CBD Company, um, converted their liquid CBD manufacturing to a hand sanitizer. Um, so we were very fortunate that he did that early. Um, and we do know that, you know, finding hand sanitizers is tough. So we did, if you go on our website, europasports.com, as an end consumer, you can buy hand sanitizers from us. We're probably going to open up mask uh, as well as cleaning supplies because um, right now you just can't find those. And so, and, and it, it does, I mean, it, it helps us, but we don't really want to compete against the people who support us. Um, even though a lot of them are shut down right now. And we do know that a lot of the, a lot of those people are buying from uh, places that we don't sell. Um, so, you know, we're kind of cutting ourselves in, but right now we don't sell to the end consumer. Um, so if you're a retailer, you know, if, if anybody that has a, 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 you know, a beauty shop or that, you know, can be a clothing store. Um, we've got, we, we did go out and investigate cleaning supplies um, and we tried to find the best, you know, fortunately being in this industry so long, um, we, we were able to, to talk to people about the best cleaning solutions, the best, you know, wipe downs, the best hand sanitizers, because you just can't put cleaning solution on a bench. Um, 
you know, so we, we have done a lot of research trying to make sure that our whole goal is as fitness centers, gyms, studios, and boxes begin to open, you know, I try to tell, I try to tell our, our gym owners, stop posting that you've painted or bought a new squat rack. The, people don't care right now. What they care about is how clean is, is the facility going to be? What precautions have you taken for me not to get sick? Now, people want to get back in the gyms. They're dying. If you look at, if you look at what's happening in New Jersey, New Jersey. with Achilles Gym, everybody sees the social media part of it. They don't see the back end stuff that legally these guys are going to go through. You know, they're, they're talking about, yeah, it's, it, I, I do think the police pulling people over coming out of the gyms. Do I think that's happening? Yeah, I do. Do I think they're getting harassed? Yeah, I do. Do I think that they're, that, that, that these guys are getting severe fines on the backside that they're going to be responsible for? Yeah, I do. Do I think that, you know, they potentially could have a business license yanked? If you get your business license yanked in North Carolina, you're, you can't apply for another business license. And that's what, that's what a lot of these gym owners or the, the, the gym members, they're rushing back in, but they need to, they need to write the congressman, they, their, their governor and say, look, You've got to open this gym up, not so I can go squat a thousand pounds. It's just so I can beat this thing if I get it. And walking outside will not beat this, will not beat it. Just won't happen. So, but, you know, they can learn about us if they go to europasports.com. It's kind of, I mean, it's kind of boring. We're, we're really just a distributor. We have a lot of um, facets in the game with the Europa games, with, you know, a lot going on, you know, and I do want to digress a little bit. You, you brought up the Europa man. Yeah. Most, people don't realize, <laughs> most people don't realize that in 1989, I had that character drawn out as a stick figure character. And early in the day, we used to post the stick figure. It's my head, Jeff's upper body, my legs. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, but when, when we were able to morph it into 3d, is when it expanded out, but as as I had the guy draw it, and I used to carry a flat top. It was it was my head, Jeff's upper body, and my legs. That that's that's where he came from. That is such a legend. <laughs> when you see Europa Man, everybody's like Europa Man. It's like yeah. it's iconic. Well, I'll tell you. So he's been. If you look at where's Europa Man, he traveled with General Petraeus in Afghanistan. He he's that that statue has been. Um, all over the world. It's been in, it's, it's up on the big green board yep. and at, you know, in Boston, it's, I mean, that guy, it, it, it's been on an admiral's um, uh, uh, personal craft for the, for the Navy. It, he, he's been a lot of places. It's been fun to watch. That is so cool. I just, yeah. I love it, man. I love everything about this first class operation that you guys do. So we want to thank our guest today, Eric Hillman, for investing in all of our listeners. Thank you so much, Eric, for being on the show. Yeah, no, I appreciate you guys having me. Thank you.